Hello, and welcome to the Stafford Boxing Report. I am Sheila. I am Stafford. Oh, my man. Man. Oops, we have to do that again. I'm sorry. I messed it up. What? We lied, though. No, no, this. We, oh. <laughs> Stafford Boxing. The making of champions. Today, we have a special, special guest. The big dog. A legend, Mr. Rick Glazer. I have to take a deep breath because we have a lot going on. He is a promoter, a matchmaker, international agent, advisor, New York State Boxing Hall of Fame inductee and International Boxing Hall of Fame elector. And I hope I did not miss anything. And besides him having great wisdom on the boxing side as well as the business side and the boxing industry, everybody please stand up, clap your hands, and welcome Rick Glazer. <laughs> Woo! Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me uh, on your show today. Um, actually, I haven't been a promoter since the recession of 2008 started. And um, what really happened was that so many people were getting laid off in the boxing business worldwide um, at an average four people per company. And they started to sublet me their work. And that overcame what I had been prior doing. And it uh, developed into a, um, a services business. And uh Today, I, I'm supplying supplemental quality supplemental services to boxing promoters and uh, TV networks, um, managers, attorneys, everything all over the world every day. That's what I do. So um, it's fun. It's interesting. And no two, day, no two days are, are the same ever. I know it's not because I think you are busy 24-7, 365 days. Yeah, it, um, there's not enough time to promote. See, what happens is just to let you know, when you promote a show, it takes, and, 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 without, and I always did it without a staff. I always worked with another promoter. We, you know, Mike Akery's now passed away. We did a lot of things that, together. But what happens is that it takes you six weeks to two months to put a quality show together and keep it together and publicize it, market it properly, and that would take away from the bit my core business, which is supplying services now. And then you, instead of supplying, let's say, 16 different deals a month for various people, you're down to eight and you can't make what you make on that one show, what you lose on the other eight deals. You can't, you don't have time to do. And you have disgruntled clients. And the problem is, since I have so many promoters as clients, your promoters will now look at you as a competitor, being a fellow promoter, rather than a person working hand in hand with them on a daily basis. So I elected to um, not promote anymore. And that was quite a few years ago. That was um, basically uh, in 2009, I decided to do that. So um, here we are today. Okay, so... Since we are, t even though I know you said that you don't do the promoting anymore, but you do work with promoters, yes. I, have, I have a question. For a woman that wants to come into the boxing industry as an independent promoter, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it has nothing to do with a woman. It would be anybody, male or female. OK, so I always say this. Everything is equal unless it's an actual sexual act. OK, so that's just a joke, of course. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but um, you, in today's marketplace, you'd have to have some kind of facility that's relatively convenient for everybody to, to the masses and relatively inexpensive. Uh, you can't go to do a club show and the guy charge you twenty thousand dollars for the ballroom or something crazy like that. Um, you've got to come on, come in with wherewithal. You have to have solid financial background and understand business finance and um, what it incorporates to make an overhead um, in boxing work a, a show that's budgeted. And you have to have some kind of income, so besides ticket sales such as sponsorships 
and um, and some kind of uh, streaming service to su help supplement your costs. Um, one of the things that I've noticed about promoters that came in the business and that, that I had, ta had done shows before I even talked to them, and they were complaining, they, they were calling me because they lost money and they were trying to figure out how to, is that their overhead for the shows were not realistic. I'll give you an example. Um, I had a guy who called me one time about seven, eight years ago. He had a $60,000 overhead for a show, which is not crazy. The problem is that his, his he only had 800 seats in the building, in the place, and his average ticket price was 60 bucks. So that only comes out to $48,000. And without additional revenue, such as um, a streaming service and such as sponsorship, even if he sold out, he'd be twelve thousand dollars upside down, and he never bothered to figure that out because the guy who brought him into the business was just as green as he was. So I explained to him that you know you need to get more money for your ticket sales. You need to go to a little bigger facility if you already sold out eight hundred seats, and you got to cut your overhead down, and you have to have more auxiliary income. Well, he balanced all that out, and he became profitable. And 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 the, and the and the third well, he had done two shows before he met me, and he became profitable in the third show. So that's one of the services I do provide. You know, the smaller type of promoters and stuff, and trying to figure out a good balance between, you know, a cost and cost effectiveness and potential income or potential loss. Uh, you know, sometimes you know you're going to lose money on a show, like a. a, a it's a it's a manager that says, hey, I got to get my fighter a bunch of wins. This guy lost. This guy, this guy lost. He's going to lose money on the show. Well, we got to keep those losses to a minimum. And that's how you do it. You know, it's that. So you make it as cost effective as possible, even if it's going to lose money. Gotcha. Now, still speaking on the promotion part, what do you think about? OK, now we have Clarissa Shields and Savannah Marshall. They're in the UK and they have their fight that's going on. Do you think that outside of the United States, it's more accepted uh, for the female fighters, like to give them an opportunity? Because there's been so many stories that I've heard where the, an event was supposed to take place, but then at the last minute, they end up canceling the fight because they said, well, the female fighters aren't going to be bringing in any money. Well, so I don't know. I, I haven't heard of that in particular, but this show won't be that way. It's, it's on TV. Uh, it's probably streaming, I believe, or it's either on, I don't know what it's on, but it's a big enough fight that it's going to be, I believe, on Sky TV in the UK, I believe. I'm pretty sure. Um, and it'll probably, you know, it'll be on some kind of, um, um, Maybe ESPN Plus over here. I don't know. But that's a big enough fight. We won't have to worry about that. Shows getting canceled, smaller shows because of the lack of revenue or the lack of funding because the guy didn't realize he was getting in that deep um, is, is a problem on a, on a smaller level. But it's not on a national level. Okay, gotcha. Um, baby, did you, you said you wanted to ask him a question. Yeah. I don't want to keep on going, going. No, no, you're doing a great <laughs> job. You're doing a great job. She, she's the one that really prepared for this. I mean, she, I, she was up nights, uh, you know, just preparing. And I really admire her for her preparation to be able to provide a great service when she interviewed, uh, anyone. But my question that I had was, what's the difference, um, uh, today in terms of the boxing in industry compared to years ago? Um, the, the, it won't encompass in an hour or it would take a month. But the, the, to start out with, when I started in boxing in 1991, you used to call up a manager and he used to say to you, I said, hey, um, I got a fight for your fighter. Oh, yeah, but, but give me the information. Da, da, da. Yeah, we'll take that fight. Or he'll negotiate with you from there. Yeah, okay. And you'll, yeah, okay. You agree to a price. We'll take it. Today, he said, well, I got to talk to the fighter, the trader, the fighter's uh, wife, the fighter's mother. Um, the, the list goes on and on. And it, it, the, the, the managers are not in control of their fighters like they used to be, number one. 
Number two is the trainers have more control because they're in the fight. They're in the gym with the fighters where the fighters, the manager used to go, used to be real fight managers. They used to be in the tra- in the gym with the trainer and the fighter. Today, they're, they're lawyers because they're in the courtroom, a lot of them. They're, bit, they're investors. They're not real managers. So they're not in the gym with the fighters. So the fighter, the trainer has more control than ever. Uh, the fighter's wife is, is big if they're married. If they're not married, believe it or not, their mother, their father. Just the way it is. Um, you need permission from an awful lot of people to, today to make one fight. That's a big difference. The second is, it used to be in the early 90s uh, and mid-90s and even the late 90s. You put out a fight poster and lo- for a little local show and the people flock out. You know, 1,200, 1,500 people. Today, you got to really, 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 really work to get the same amount of people in that same show. Now, I'm not saying you can't, but you've got to work a lot harder to do so, okay, on the grassroots level. You know, where you used to just put out posters and say, hey, you're, um, you're, um, you're, the tickets are for sale at, at D's Cigar Store and, uh, and, and, this, and Vito's Market, you know, and you used to go, hey, you got tickets for the boxer? Yeah, you give me 30 bucks, you know, give me 60 bucks and give me two tickets. Today, it's not that easy. Today, because of counterfeiting, you have to have like um, a ticket master involved. You know, these companies that, that sell these tickets, you can't have your local people counterfeit the tickets today is a problem. Just like hiring the pay-per-view is a problem for the bigger shows. So everything has gotten more sophisticated. OK, and the big thing today is um, t- the TV alliances um, and the streaming alliances have caused a lot of fights not to take place. You know, the other side of the street mentality. The fighters don't have the gumption they used to have to, to, to fight the best. There's, they don't have as many legacy fights today because the fighters don't have the gumption to, to, to form a great legacy. Just the way it is today. Different mentality. Well, an- another question you might be asking. No, Why do you have the passion that you have today that you had like back in 1991, because just listening to you, you're very thorough, but at the same time, you can hear passion with your words. Well, you, I'm what they call a boxing lifer. I even hashtag that, um, hashtag boxing lifer. And um, I'm in it for the good, the bad, and the indifferent. It's just the way it is. I came into it. I didn't come into it looking at the world through looking at boxing through rose colored glasses. I knew it was a tough business and I'm a tough guy. So I just figured it was a good blend and it remains a good blend for me today. Hey, I'm 64 years old. What am I supposed to do? Go out and sell wristwatches for a living or use cars or, or become a real estate developer. I am what I am. That's not going to change. And, and, and you might as well wake up with the greatest attitude in the world every morning. If, and I wake up at three, four o'clock in the morning uh, to do my international business. And um, it's like uh, I wake up with that, you know, that tear your head off and shit in your neck mentality that you have to have to succeed in life. So and that's how I that's how I think, you know, um, that's the best way to think. You know, you can't let the world walk over you and um, you've got to wake up with that passion every day and be the same person you are the prior day and every day. And, um, you know, I always say be the best person you can daily and do it every day. So that's what I am. Facts. I agree with that. I agree too. I have a question about how the how the matchmaking is with the boxers, because sometimes when I see some of these fights, I'm like, I don't really understand why they would have had the boxer that's like not really doing anything and getting tore up from his opponent. So can you give me your opinion well, on matchmaking? Well, it, so every, there, when a fight gets made, there's a reason why every fight gets made. It just doesn't get made, okay? So it's either the promoter's fighter, they're looking for a soft win. It's either the promoter's fighter, and they're looking to put him in deep to see how much he can fight, okay? Um, they're, or they're looking for a, a deep fight because they need to sell it to the TV network or satisfy the TV network. Or the guy's a local ticket seller, and he can put asses in the seats. 
So if he can't fight much and they can put ashes in the seat, they're not going to put him in with much. A typical, um, a typical uh, situation, like and using an example, would be uh, Campbell Hatton, Ricky Hatton's son over in the UK. Big ticket seller, can't fight much, and, and every time they get in the ring, they hope and pray he's going to win with the opponent that they put him in with. Okay? Um, and sometimes the guy's on the card because of the fact that he sparred with the guy who's the main event as the promoter's fighter and the, and the guy says, listen, um, the, the manager of the sparring partner says, listen, I want you to get him a win on the show. You don't have to pay him. Just get him a win on the show. Okay. That's part of the deal. You know, so there's always a reason why somebody's on the show. They just didn't appear there by accident. And that's what people, a lot of people don't understand. Gotcha. Another question. So I hear sometimes, especially while I read on Twitter, boxers being upset with promoters because they wasn't treated right or they wasn't getting their due pay. Do you think that promoters and even the managers, do you think a lot of them may take advantage of their boxers because their boxers don't have the the know about of what the they sophistication the sophistication you mean yes is that the word you're looking for yes um, I would say that's that's probably a third of the time I think it's a third of the time that the fighter overestimates his value to society and thinks he's worth more than he is or should be treated better than he is. And I think a third of it's just a misunderstanding between the promoter and the fighter and the promoter not being honest with the fighter, the manager, where the fighter, what the fighter means to that promoter, that promotional company, that promotion. And I think that's a, that's a big misunderstanding that causes a lot of problems. Now, if a guy's beefy, let's just say, for instance, um, you're on a pay-per-view show and there's four fights on the pay-per-view. Let's say the main event was Fury and Wilder. Let me just give you an example. And the co feature of this world title fight, then there's two eliminators. You're an eight-rounder on the undercard. Shut the, shut the hell up and just be glad you're on the card. Stop barking. You know? So it depends on the situation. But like I said, a third or a third and a third is about right there. Gotcha. Um, what do you think about the, fo excuse me, the boxers today compared to the boxers um, in the late 90s and 80s? They're soft as fuck, excuse me for swearing, but they are. They just, it's a different state of mind today, different mentality. Uh, everybody's, because of the Floyd Mayweather, Al Heyman effect, everybody's afraid to have a, have, have a, have a, have a one next to their, uh, the, and their record in the loss column. That, so they don't, they don't take challenging fights. Um, it's a real problem today. It really is. It's a very, very big problem today. Um, the problem is, the sport is um, the hurt business, and people think they're going to get hurt, and not physically hurt, but hurt by their reputation, and um, they're afraid to lose. Where Roberto Duran, Sugar Ray Leonard, Tommy Hearns, Hagel, they all lost fights. They came back, and they performed 100%, and they kept getting opportunities. It's now everybody misunderstands something. To make the biggest bucks, yeah, you got to keep winning. But if you lose and you gave 100% of yourself a sensational fight, as soon as you're ready to fight, you're going to be fighting again. Okay? And that's the way it is. And, and even a rematch or, or whatever the situation is, it, it, losing is not an end-all. People think it's an end-all. And, that, and that's a complete fallacy and myth in people's minds. And guys like Al Heyman and Floyd Mayweather put it in their minds. Andrew Galata fought four times for the World Heavyweight Championship. Never won one time, but he was still given a lot of opportunities, wasn't he? Yeah. Right? So and he man, lost twice man. against Riddick Bowe, and he still got more opportunities because he gave 100% of himself. And that's all, you know, Yaki Lopez gave 100% of himself. That's the key. So Our Churl Gaddy. What about Churl Gaddy? Another one. The, the list goes on and on. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Rick. Let me ask you a question. What? Sure. What, is, what is it about Al Heyman that that displeases you? It, it's crimes against boxing. He does things that are against boxing, and I call I call anybody. It's not just Al Heyman. 
And when Bob Aaron did something against boxing a couple of years ago, people were shocked. I called him out. I said, wait, with me, you're either right or wrong. I don't care who's wrong. I told Don King recently, one-on-one, -on -one, Don, you're wrong. That's all there is to it. That's not how it should be done. And that's how I am. I've always, I'm have i very straight up and people can't handle it. The difference why Al Heyman is because he does so much wrong almost daily. That's what compared to the other promoters who do something wrong once in a while. And, you know, Don, he, Al Heyman can call himself an advisor, okay, but he's a promoter. He secured the TV deals. He's dwelling out the money. He determines who's going to be on his show and who fights who. He's the promoter. I don't care what the law says. Well, what a court of law said that he's not a promoter. He assigns the promoter. He determines where the fight's going to be. He's the promoter. So let me ask you a question about Don King. So uh, I was having a discussion with Sheila, and she told me that recently. Um, no, she said the reason why uh, Don King did business with you was because. Would you say well, that? he he heard uh, Rick Glacier's oh, yeah, 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 yeah. names every day. Yeah. So how yeah. did you, so so how did you and Don King get together? Well, um, I had, was doing business with his son Carl. Carl had a management company back then called Monarch Man Management, and um, I was supplying sparring partners and um, some opponents for some of his fighters, but mostly sparring partners. And um, he wanted to get me and um, have that meet, have me uh, Don meet and stuff and do business and stuff. And in 2003, it basically finally happened. And um, Don started, when Don first um, started talking to me, he said, you know, I knew we had to work together. I hear your name seven times a day, except on Sundays. He says, how come on Sundays? Because I don't work as hard on Sunday. So, um, you know, people all over the world were mentioning my name. Like, in, like in, well, let me talk to my man. Let me talk to Rick Laser. Let me find out what he thinks. Let me, you know. And he kept hearing my name so much that he said he felt he had a, he, there was something special about me and he had to work with me. And we worked together from uh, 2003 to 2016. Mm. And um, I, I never worked for Don. Don was technically a client of mine. Um, Glazerboxing.com being my company. And um, I we stopped because I had cancer. I couldn't travel anymore. And I was on my base at my deathbed. I outlived cancer, um, believe it or not. Hey, and I, when I stayed on my deathbed, uh, hey. they told my wife to start making arrangements. And did you start making arrangements? I mean, they gave me no chance to walk out of that um, hospital. So, and I did. Um, and um, once I came out three, uh, three years and two months later, um, Don was in a regressed state um, in boxing, and I I helped Don here and there, but he's no longer. I I wouldn't call him a client anymore. He's more my dear friend. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, what do you think about the relationship between Don King and Mike Tyson now, compared to how it started to now how it is today? Well, I I blame I I, I tell you who I blame. I blame all the people that were around Mike putting filling Mike in Mike's head um, that Don was ripping him off. Let me just explain it to everybody. And I explain this all the time when I'm podcast because everybody talks to me about Mike because, about Don King and Mike Tyson because my relation with Don. First of all, I was never around Don when Mike was around Don. Okay, he was uh, he was around Don till eighty ninety seven. I didn't come on the Don King um, wagon until two thousand and three. Okay, so I didn't have any, there was no overlapping period there. Okay, but understand this. Okay, Don King and Mike Tyson handled over a billion dollars together. A billion. Okay, not a million with a, with a M, a B, a billion back then. Maybe. Yeah, of course. All the pay-per-view money, all the all the site feed money, all the foreign TV revenues. Oh yeah, every, you no know, question. A billion billion dollars they handled. You're a gross handle. You ready? There was 14 million missing, and Don's worth 250 million dollars approximately thereof. You really think over all that period of time, from 1986, 87. All the way up to 1997, over a 10-year period, you really think Don stole 
uh, $14 million, uh, $1.4 million a year, $1.4 million a year, which is a little, about $120,000 a month. Or do you think that maybe that money was misappropriated and lost in the shuffle over a 10 year period? Okay, and there was uh, expenses that, let, that 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 nobody talked about, such as um, Don uh, when Don had relocated to Florida. Mike got out of prison. Mike wanted a New York City presence. He had to go get him a, a New York go, go get an office in New York. He had to get somebody to run his fan club, which was his daughter, which was might as well be his Don's daughter because you got to hire somebody. You might as well make it your daughter if, she, if she's qualified. Well, make a long story short, there wasn't fourteen million dollars missing. Okay, it was used up in the, over, over that kind of period of time. Like Don giving Mike two hundred thousand cash when he saw him. Oh, I need some money. Oh, here's two hundred thousand cash. That's the relationship they had. Well, when it was all said and done, when Don sued, when uh, Mike sued Don. Okay, Don didn't have all the records in place because they were so. He never thought it would come to that. But two hundred thousand a year, send my baby's mama, a baby mama of mine, two hundred thousand. Do this, do that, do this, do that. Well, when it all and, and the New York City office and and the um and um the daughter being the uh, head of the fan club, all that added up to one to fourteen million dollars over a ten year period. Well, does anybody really think that a guy worth two hundred and fifty million dollars, he's making millions every time Mike Tyson steps in the ring, is going to rob Mike Tyson out of one point four million a year when he's making twenty five million a year from him? No. And, and common sense must prevail. I'll leave it like that. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Boy, that was. Whew. Hey, I'm glad that you shared this on the Stafford Boxing Report. So now we have some clarity. I'm glad I was able to do so. And if I, if hey, I died of cancer, I wouldn't have done, I wouldn't have been able to do so. Hey, man, thank you. Um, I got one more question. I'm going to let you jump in. You can ask as many as you want. So what do you think about uh, Javante Davis and Earl Spence and some of the other uh, top fighter in the I think they are in the 135 140 uh class 147 135 and 147 that's correct yep what about them well I wanted to get your opinion on uh Javante Davis like compare him to let's say an old school fighter do you see any resemblance of him compared to an old fighter that you used to watch coming up during your time well, uh, three things. Um, he's tenacious at times. He's late, mentally and physically lazy at other times in the ring. And he's left-handed. So to compare him to old-timers where most of the fighters were right-handers back then, and um, most of the fighters were like, you know, either complete boxers or in your face, he's a very unique fighter. He's a, he, he turns it on and turns it off, and he's left-handed. It's hard to compare him to somebody you saw in the past that that it would be left-handed and and would be tenacious or or a boxer because sometimes he boxes sometimes he's lazy sometimes he's aggressive you don't know what he's going to be and um and be left-handed you know there's not a lot of the great old timers were all they were all right-handed very few left-handed so what's your definition of a complete fighter? Oh, I was just going to ask him that. Because, too. like... Um, a complete fighter, in my opinion right now, would be... Um, um, let's see. I would say Bam Rodriguez, the 115-pound WBC champ that just came on the scene this year. He's a complete fighter. Okay? Uh, Terrence Crawford, complete fighter. Uh, Shakur Stevenson is on his way to being a complete fighter. No question about it. Um, I would say that um, I'm thinking here. Who what else would be a complete Earl fighter? Spence? I was going to ask that. Who? Earl? <laughs> what about Earl Spence? He's he's close to being a complete fighter, but I, he didn't look too good too good to um, get an Ugas in spots. But he is he's overall a relatively complete fighter, yes. So Haney. If, Okay. I like Haney. Okay. What Haney, about Haney, Haney? No, Haney, Haney can't punch. He's not a complete fighter. Okay. Haney's not a puncher. Haney, uh, the rest of Haney's complete. 
but Haney's not a puncher. He's not a complete fighter. What about Garcia? Who? Which Garcia? Ryan. He's not. He's far from a complete fighter right now. He's um. He's got a lot to prove yet to me, even though he looks good so far. You know, he. But remember something. He's fighting tailor-made guys, guys that are right in front of you, guys you can't miss. And also, he's fighting shorter guys, and he's a tall guy, so he's punching down at people, which makes it a lot easier. Because he sure has been talking a lot about Tank, and on the our last show, I was like, he's not ready. He has. Well, he <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if he's ready or not. I if I had Tank, I, I'm sorry. If I had Ryan, I wouldn't put him in. But the problem is, if I had Tank. I wouldn't put him in with, with, with Ryan because Ryan's got fast hands that can punch. And Tank's a little guy. He's only about five foot five, maybe maybe five six, and uh, Ryan's about five ten. That's a big difference in the lightweight division. And punching down at somebody like that, it's it's a big advantage uh, to Ryan Garcia, even though I think that um, Davis is more polished and seasoned at this point. There, there, remember, there's about a four and a half year span between them age wise. And that's pretty big. You know, experience-wise, too. You know, remember, remember, Ryan's, I mean, uh, uh, Tank's already been in multiple, multiple world title fights. You know, be it their only secondary titles or not the full title, but it is what it is. So, so Rick, if I had to ask your your uh, decision right now, who are you taking? Uh, Earl Spence? Cross or if, 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 Cross if, if the fight happens, if. There's a big if there. I, I, I like Crawford. Faster, more nimble on his feet, switches lefty to righty, and is more of a killer instinct. And he trains all the time, where Spence just trains to fight. There's a big difference between training to fight and training all the time. Uh, Bernard Hopkins trained all the time. You saw how much longevity he had and what he did with that. Just the way it is. Yeah, that's what I've been seeing. A, a lot of these fighters, they just don't have that endurance, that longevity. And it's like they get tired so quick, almost between like the second, third, maybe fourth round. And well, the reason for that, there's a reason for that. The reason is that fighters are getting in the gym to lose weight, to make the weight to fight. They're not in the gym getting in great shape because they were already in good shape before they got in the gym. They're not staying in touch. That's why certain fighters go through a fight like ease. Some of them can't make it through a fight. And that's exactly the reason, right? Just right there. Okay. That, that they're not in the gym, that they're, that they get in to, to lose weight. And that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to get in the gym to get in supreme fighting shape and supreme fighting shape. Okay. And to hone your skills not to not to lose weight. You're supposed to be on weight all the time within within a reasonable amount to make the weight easily, not having to go in the gym to sweat the weight off. Gotcha. Does that, does that all make sense? Yeah. yeah. So with you just saying what you just said, mm -hmm. what what do you look for in a boxing trainer? Um I look at I there's three things that I look at immediately, okay? And and it's chemistry between the what that fighter, how that fighter, I mean how that trainer can help that fighter. So when Kevin Rooney was around, he worked really well with short fighters, Vinny Pazienza, Mike Tyson, the list goes on and on. I wouldn't send him a real tall guy. Okay. Um, another thing is I think Robert Garcia, it doesn't matter who wins or loses, Joshua or Rusak. I'm just making a point here. Robert Garcia is a fighter that works with smaller fighters and, and, and works with heavily on body shots. How do you, you can't work heavily on body shots in the heavyweight division because they don't throw body shots. And, and, and even if you taught them how, they're not going to. It's a different division altogether. They're, they're very unique. So... Um, the, those two things that I look at, and the third thing I look at is communication skills. Is that fighter, is that trainer dysfunctional? Is he going to be late to the gym? Is is that fighter a self starter? And, and okay, if he is, then the, if the if the if the winning call, the trainer's a little 
a little lazy himself, then you're going to say, okay, well, it's the trainer's a self-starter. But the trainer's not a self-starter. I mean, sorry, the fighter's not a self-starter. You need a, uh, a trainer to be all over that fight. Mm. Those are three things that I look at um, heavily. Right. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Now, I got a question. So, for us, we are inspired by Custom Model, and I know that you're very familiar with him because if you know, just listening to you, it sounds like you're from New York. Is that where you're from, New York? Yeah, well, I'm, in, I'm from a suburb of Buffalo called Williamsville. And um, we, like to, we like to say that we're part of New York, but we're on the good end of the state. Gotcha. So I'm a big fan of Cuss. I'm not even going to lie. I mean, every book that I possibly could find on Cuss, I was able to order it, and I've been reading it. But, you know, a person that's older – than myself, you have a little bit more uh, understanding and respect for his crab as a trainer, as well mm -hmm. as multiple other things. I would like to personally know what's your personal opinion about Custom Auto Legacy? Um, it was a great trainer. I mean, you know, the, the the record speaks for itself. World champions on top of, you know, a whole bunch of champs. And, you know, Jose Torres, um, Floyd Patterson, honed Mike Tyson from the beginning. I mean, the, and, and a whole bunch of other fighters that were champions, but not huge names. But he was as good as it gets back in the day. I mean, I consider Ray Arcel to be the greatest trainer of all time. Um, I consider Custom Auto to be a, um, a sure top six or seven great all time great trainer, and he, you know, he definitely wor warrants um, your respect. There's no question about it. He was a great trainer, and um, he was a um, he was a, he was a mental motivator. It was what I call a mental motivator. He got he knew what to say to the fighters to to um, to get them going, and um, he he wanted to understand his fighter. In other words. Some guys are with a woman. Let's just say, for instance, they're not. They're they're in this day and age. They call them, uh, you know, you know, they're the baby's mama. But if if that woman didn't float his boat, but it was a he, but it was about the kid, he would say, "Oh, you know, uh, you, you know, you know, you know, your son Javon. He, he, you know, you know, he wants you to come home, and he he wants you to be smiling when you see him and stuff." So he would get into the fighters' heads. Now, if he knew that he didn't have a great relationship with the woman, he wouldn't even mention her. Okay, so he was a, he was a psychological genius as a trainer, and to be a great trainer, you have to that has to be part of your chemical makeup to be able to understand the fighters better. Teddy Atlas is great at that. Okay, Emmanuel Stewart was great at that. Robert Garcia is great at that. Okay, these are just some of the fighters that are really good. I mean, some of the trainers that are really good at it. And it's not, you know, the great line about boxing is it's not just physical, it's mental. Well, it's true. And you've got to know what motivates, you got to know what motivates your fighter, you know. And, you know, if he's scared of the feet, you know, you get, you got to say to him, listen, put the, put the feet out of your mind. You're, you're the champ. You're great. You got to know what to say. And he, he knew what to say at the right time. And he wasn't a phony. He was very, a, as a human being, he was a very caring and um, uh, I'm looking for the right word. I didn't know him, but everybody has told me he's very caring and uh, nurturing. Nurturing. That's the word I'm looking for. And that's important. That's very important. So what do you think about the peekaboo uh, boxing style? Is that one of your favorite? Well, for a short guy, like I said about Kevin Rooney before, for a short guy, it works really well. It's a great, it's a great style. If you're short, if you're tall, it doesn't do it. It doesn't have that effect. No, but it, it's a very good style. Listen, there's nothing that was wrong with Custom Auto. He was right outside of New York City in the Catskills. It was a perfect location where you can go into the city for a meeting. The fighters had a camp where they were close to their families, but they were far enough away, you know, and stuff. He'd monitor their phone calls. He knew boxing. He knew the science. He knew the um, the, the mental makeup of the fighters. He, he had the psychology. And there's, there's zero, zero, zero wrong about him. Okay? In other words, if you were to, if you were to make up a trainer 
let's say you would you would have put a trainer on a blackboard and you say this is what I want in the trainer. Cust custom auto's name would come up ninety nine percent of the time. I mean, he was he was custom auto. That's all there is to it. I mean, to, you know, it's a funny thing. It was once said, if you're if if you're known by one name, you're an icon. Well, everybody, if you name Cust, no, everybody knows who it is. There's no question about it. So that's a great sign. I got I got another question. So you talk about the peekaboo um, boxing style is good for short fighters. What is a sure. good What is a good boxing style for a tall fighter, in your opinion? Jab and keep your feet moving, moving left to right, right to left, whichever is more natural, and keep the jab on the person and come back with the right hand. Most tall guys don't throw good left hooks. Most short guys do. Okay, um, very, very few tall guys threw really good left hooks. If you look at Lennox Lewis, L Larry Holmes, all your taller fighters, they never threw great left hooks. They always threw booming right hands. So there, there's your example right there. You know, so you, you got to stick to the jab. No, most tall people have long arms. Most tall people jab well. Got to use the jab, and move to the left or to the right, whichever is more natural for you. Unless, of course, the guy's got a good hook that you're fighting and you don't want to walk into that punch or vice versa, uh, um, the great right hand. But as a general rule, you know, left to right and um, right to left and keeping the jab on somebody. And, and, and I say keep the jab. I don't mean like flick it out once in a while. Keep popping that thing. Keep Because when you throw a lot of jabs, you're going to find openings for the right hand. It's a, nat it's a natural act. I have a question from Vinny Allaby. Do you have a favorite heavyweight fight of all time? Well, the first big fight I saw and was at the movie theater was March 8, 1971. Um, Ali Frazier won, which was really tip was really Frazier Ali because he Frazier won one. But um, I would say that one. Uh, would be one of my favorites. It was one of the great heavyweight fights of all time, and because it was my first big experience. And um, I would say, um, I would say Larry Holmes, Ken Norton would be number two. I thought that was a sensational 15 round fight, non stop action, split decision. Can't beat that. Great fight. So, what about your uh, middleweight? Um, I would say Barkley Duran, um, was great. Um, February, 1989, Atlantic city, uh, Duran on the comeback, um, a big upset was, was older at the time, uh, 38 years old. Um, uh, Barkley was a real champ. He just knocked out, he had beaten Tommy Ernest twice, including once by knockout. And um, I would think that that was a great, great, great fight. And it came right down to the end. And uh, and Duran knocking him down got the decision. So I would say uh, Bar Dur uh, Duran Barkley, I would say, would be my best middleweight fight. What about lightweight? Um, I would say, uh, um, well, I'm a little biased on that because I was Paul Spadafore's matchmaker. So when he won the lightweight championship of the world, the IBF light in uh, 19, uh, 1999 when he fought uh, Pio Cardona. But for non-financial involvement, I would say uh, July 1984 um, uh, in Puerto Rico, um, Edwin Rosario and Howard Davis Jr. WBC World Lightweight Championship split decision. Howard Davis got dropped in the last round to secure the victory for Edwin Rosario. It was a sensational fight. It was a mandatory and uh, a fight, and it was sensational in front of a packed um, outside audience. And I think that would be probably my number one lightweight fight of all time. Gotcha. You had a question? No, I have a question from Scrapbook Boxing. Hello. Who was Hello. your greatest fighter of all time? I mean, that I had, that I worked with? I guess well, who is the greatest time. fighter? That I worked with or or greatest was, fighter, period? I'm confused. Period. Period. Oh, period. Oh, okay. Um, I, Sugar Sugar Robinson would be a, a no-brainer. Not even a, not even a, not even a close second. 
you know, and, and my clo- my second would be Henry Armstrong. Henry Armstrong. Mm-hmm. Baby, what was that fight that, that that fought that fight that you just watched um, over the weekend? Oh, Florence Jr. Oh, let me say before we talk about that, uh, Ricochet. Hello, talking and Rick Glazer. Hello, Ricochet. Thank you for being here and everybody else. And you're welcome, Scrapbook Boxing. Yeah, there was a fight. It was actually a few fights that was going on. I know I was watching the one. Was it the one with, um, oh, Cabarea? If I'm, am I pronouncing his name right versus Flores Jr.? Yeah, this, this past week, yeah, yeah, Cabrera and Flores Jr., yes. Yeah, so what about it? How did you think about that fight because it was so quick with that seven-second knockout? Well, no, no, the fight went to distance, but it almost ended in the first round. Um, uh, Cabrera is, is one of those type of fighters. He can get beat in any night by anybody, but Flores is, is, should never fight again. He's completely regressed from what he was a year and a half ago, and um, he's gone downhill drastically, and um, I, think he's, I think there's damage there. I really do. He's, he's slow. He gets hit with everything now. Um, he, he pushes a lot of his punches, and it's, all, it's not a good side. He's, he's way beyond the back nine. He's shot. Should never fight again. Rick, what age do you think a young, well, a parent should introduce their child to boxing? Well, I'm not in the amateurs at all, but I would say probably realistically when he's more physically mature, the seventh grade, he'd be 12 years old. These kids are starting six, seven, eight, or too young. 12 years old is about right. I saw that you had made a post and it was a joke about the Flintstones. I didn't really get it. I think if you were talking about- Oh, about Ross Thompson. So- Ross is um, an old school guy and he's never developed into these apps and he calls it cell phone boxing and and he, he doesn't know even how to use an app, doesn't have one. And most of your fights are on apps now. And he's just, I call him the Freddie Flintstone of boxing because he's so, he's so out of it, uh, technology and stuff like that. And, you know, that's what he is. I mean, he's my friend. I, I, I've gone out with him socially. I wrote, I, if you call me tonight, say, Rick, let's go to dinner. I'll buy him dinner. I love the guy, but, but that doesn't make him that Freddie Flintstone, you know? <laughs> and he, all, he just is like, he doesn't get it. I mean, the reason why people don't get this, the reason why fights are on apps and not on TV is because the apps can control everything. Number one, it's world. An app is worldwide, and it's accessibility to the to the customers. If you get it, so in other words, let's say my wife. Let's let's an example. And I'm just going to use baseball as an example. The other day, a week ago, the the Friday night games on Yankee, the Yankee games are on the on the on the Prime Video app. She says, "Oh, let's go to dinner. You don't want to watch those Yankee." I said, "Honey, we can eat and watch the Yankee game at the same time." Because how's that? It's on, the, it's on an app. We, I, I, so I put the phone next to it. I asked the, the waitress for a glass, a big glass with water in it. And my wife says, you never drink water. You always, I said, that's not for me. I put the phone right down on the table, leaned it up against the water glass. And I'm watching the Yankees off this side. And I'm looking at my wife and this guy and talking to her and listening to and watching Aaron Judge hit a home run. So that's why we have apps today. And it's a apps are a great thing. I mean, it keeps the production costs down um, for 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 the net compared to a TV network. The app streaming costs a lot less. There's just so many advantages, and these guys that don't, I don't want to watch on an app. You can put it on. You can put it on your TV. If you got a smart TV, put it on your TV. But you know, don't tell, don't call it cell phone boxing. It's it's it, you make your stuff look like you're you're. You're, you're, you're two generations back, which Ross is. I'm 64, but I completely evolved with the times. When I got a website, professional website, I got my own domain. I don't use a Yahoo or Gmail. I'm in business, rickglazerboxing.com. I'm in business. I use all, all the social media. I have very little on, on Instagram, but big on Facebook, big on Twitter. And you have to evolve. 
you have to evolve. You can't sit there and do nothing and, and you'll get stagnated and you, then the world passes you by. And I, I'm not going to let that, I don't care how old I am. I'm not going to let that happen to me. If I'm going to die, it's because I, I'm in ill health and I'm dying. It's not because I'm going to kill myself because I'm in, I'm in limbo in my life. That's not going to happen. I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay, Thank you. We, have, we have another question from Batman 105 Abel. What made Emmanuel Stewart such a great trainer? Um, te he taught technical st skills great, great, and he taught great offense. And um, the you know the mental makeup of getting in a fighter's head; those three things were Emmanuel's key. Just to let you know, Emmanuel is not great at working a corner. He admitted that to me uh, several occasions, but he had a good staff around him to help him in the corner always where he only had to give the guy instructions. He didn't have to take his mouth guard in and out and let, okay, all that other stuff. And, you know, he never did cuts like Don Turner does cuts on his own fight, fighters over the years. Certain, certain trainers do, but the technical skills, teaching them offense. Okay. And the third thing being, he could get into a fighter's head. All three of those things. Okay, another question. Have you ever heard of Sam Langford? If so, what does he what do you think of him as a fighter historically? He's one of the all time greats. He was from Canada. He's one of the all time greats. Um he he's great historically, but I still think that you know, that Joe Lewis is the all-time greatest heavyweight. And, and Langford, I, I just had a, you know, you know, he's probably a top 12 heavyweight all-time, I would say. Definitely. He's ahead of Mike Tyson and Rocky Marciano, I'll tell you that. That I will tell you. So, Rick, you, you mention your wife a lot, and I really appreciate that and respect that a lot because a lot of times – Professional men don't, you know, just mention their spouse and or let the world know that they are married. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind me asking, how many years have you been married? I'll give you the whole uh, scoop. I met my wife in, um, on on uh, March twenty seventh, um, um, two thousand and twelve. I met her at a local steakhouse, um, privately owned steakhouse, and um, she was there with her girlfriend. I walked in and was meeting a friend of mine there and a guy and um she was at the bar in the corner having um appetizers and and um, a glass of wine i come rolling in and i look take one look at her i, I get, ordered some meat i looked over it again and i said oh my god i gotta meet this girl no matter what it takes by hook or crook i gotta meet this girl well i met her and exactly one year to the day after we met we got engaged, and six months later, we got married. I've been. It'll be nine years this coming November. It'll be nine years. I would do it all over again tomorrow, except this time I'd pay for all the marriage races, not 50% of it. I'm just kidding. You. <laughs> I, 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 that's a joke between my wife and I. So what happened was we went to get the marriage license. We were standing in front of the clerk. We had filled the paperwork out. The, marriage, the lady said, it'll be $40. I put $20. I said, where's your half? And she says to me, well, aren't you paying for all that? I said, I thought marriage was a partnership. Like I said, <laughs> where's your hat? So, so even the, the clerk said, I've been working here 30 years. And I've never heard something so funny in my life. And, uh, and my wife kept looking at me and said, okay, I'm smart enough to put the other 20 down. So that's what happened. So you know, we, have a, we have a great marriage. Uh, it's got its ups and downs um, because of some sh stupid shit I do, but it's not because it's like cheating or not. Like I never cheat on my wife. I'm, I'm very loyal. But it's things like, you know, she looks at things differently than I do. Um, obviously, we come from two different cultures uh, is one. Um, she looks at things differently where – she doesn't even look at prices. Like she'll go shopping for clothes or or, or at whatever. She doesn't even look at prices, handbags, you know, Louis Vuitton. Doesn't matter. It's thirty five hundred or fifty five hundred. She wants it. She gets it. You know. What I mean, it's a it's a different mentality. Um, and I'm, I'm more fiscally conservative. So other than that, 
we but we're, we're good overall. There's no there's no negativity. See, I, I love my wife. I do it all over again tomorrow. So okay. great, a great, a great lady, not a good one, a great one. Here's how I determine a great lady: a woman that would put up with me and smile about it. That's great. <laughs> all right, here's another one, Rick. Now I'm gonna be honest with you: you are the first white man that I ever spoken to that is married to a woman of color. I've never had a conversation with a white man who, who was in a relationship or married to a black woman, right? Now, mm -hmm. me personally, I know what it's like to, you know, have, you know, a relationship with a white woman and I'm also married to a black woman. And so mm -hmm. there is there, there is similarities, but there's also difference. From your mm -hmm. perspective as a white man, what was it for you to decide to marry this beautiful black woman? Because like for a white man to go outside his race to marry a black woman, it must have been mm -hmm. something special because I know that there's a lot of beautiful white women. But at the same time, when I listened mm -hmm. to what you said earlier, as soon as you walked into the restaurant, and saw her, you immediately felt like, hey, man, I need to go holler at her. And you just couldn't take take your eyes off her. So, right. Well, that's the, beauty, that, that's the beauty part. She's a beautiful woman. Uh, whether she was white or black, she's a beautiful woman. Okay. And it doesn't, does, does skin color. You know, I get accused of being a racist on, um, on Twitter an awful lot. Um, where that comes from, I don't know. You know, not only being super tight with Don King having a, an attorney till he passed away at a black attorney till he passed away. My best friend and my, my, um, my wedding was black and he still is black today. It's just a joke. Um, so the truth of the matter is um, it, there's one big difference between a black woman and a white woman. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, well, two differences really, but one, they're all really the same in this regard, right? They're all different in this regard between black and white. White women, white women think they're very, very, very important, and you have to like call them up on a Wednesday for a date on Saturday. Where, in fact, a black woman will just be a, her natural self, and you call her up at three o'clock. Hey, what are you doing tonight? Nothing. What'd you have in mind? Let's go out for dinner. Okay, see you in two hours. You do that to a, a, a white woman? Oh, my legs aren't shaved. I didn't do my hair. My fingernail, my nails aren't done. I didn't get a pedicure. Honey, I don't care what your feet look like. I want to go eat. Okay? Forget about all that shit. Just about eating. This ain't about your feet. This ain't about your legs. I want to eat. I actually go, let's go to dinner. So, that's a, that to me is a very very big difference between white and black. That's really the big big difference that I that I see. I dated a couple black women before, even though I was never in a serious relationship with them, with either of them. Okay, but that is the big difference uh, right there. Okay, the a white woman thinks you're so important and you got to let them know in advance, and and a black woman will just say, hey, they'll just wing it. You know, oh okay, I'll pick you up in two hours. Okay. You know, so that's the difference to me. Other than that, it, 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 it's all it's all equal. Um, sadly, OK, sadly, the sad part about being married to a black woman is you got ignorant friends that really that think that, um, you know, oh, Rick, you get how did you get married? Why do a black woman? Um, you know, I had it. I have to discount these people out of my life. The other one was. To be honest with you, one of the my one of my former friends, who was not a friend at that time anymore because I didn't hang around with him, but you know I ran into him at breakfast one day, and he was with a friend of mine, who okay, and I was with another guy who was friends with both all of them guys. They all yeah, yeah, uh, come on, let's join us. And he actually thinks like that. I hate to say this, but he actually thinks like black women like they have like sex like you know four times a day. Day, I mean. The ignorance of these people, and it's just you know, I, I don't know if it's the white suburban male mentality of, of stupidity, or um, if it's that particular person. But I don't like I said, I, I did have some indifferences with some friends, but most of them were very supportive. Everybody when they met my wife loved her, 
I mean, they just thought she was special. My mother loves her. My two sisters love her. I mean, I will tell you guys a really funny story that you guys will burst out laughing because this is funny. I'm making fun of myself when I say this, but to show you how I love and adored my wife is. So I, when I had the cancer, when I became an outpatient treatment, I was still on the chemo, but I was, I had to go back every 21 days for four days for the, for, you know, get pumped up with the chemo again. So I was not feeling well all the time. I was tired a lot. I'm laying in bed and was supposed to go out for dinner on a Sunday. And I said to my wife, honey, I'm too tired. Well, I'm going to stay home with you. So I said, well, let me call my sister and tell her we're not coming home. The whole family's going to be older. My mother, you know, all the BS. So it was a Sunday. I called my sister. My mother's standing there because they're making the food. You know how it goes. And I, I, they had me on speak, put me on speakerphone. I said, listen, we're not going to be coming over. I'm not feeling well. Said, What's that got to do with Sonia? You can stay home anytime. Send her over. <laughs> so, like, we don't care about you. Make sure she comes. So it's just the way, you know, you know my family was more than accepting. Um, my sister is a, um, my one sister is a, um, She's a law professor. She's a um, she's a vice dean at the University of Buffalo Law School, and she's president of the National uh, Legal Informational Services Association, which is law librarians, professors, um, people that manage law firms, record keeping. She's just took all, all her oath this past week here in the, in Denver to national convention. She she was the president of, of the elect for I think the last two years she was the president elect because she had been elected two years ago. But you serve under the um current president, um, so you learn how it goes and stuff. So there's no you know, there's no problems. Um, and my my sister had a great line about this, and she said to me, She says, Rick, all people are created by God the same way. Some know where they're going. Some never get where they're going. She goes, you knew, you knew what you're doing. You waited till you were 54 to meet the right woman. I didn't get married till I was 55. And Sonia was not, you know, she wasn't young herself. So um, she waited for the right person. I waited for the right person. And, you know, we met each other and it worked out well. She never really thought about getting married because she had met somebody she couldn't do without. And I had been in a long time relationship that, that, it's a very long story, but I was in a relationship with a woman for 26 years on and off. And um, it, it, it wasn't good. It wasn't a good one. You know, she was married to somebody else for a long period of that time. It was pretty. It was she was a, she was we were great lovers. We were horrible boyfriend and girlfriend. It's the best way to put it. Gotcha. So she finally left her husband and she could only tolerate me and I could only tolerate her for two years. So there you go. Well, Rick, I greatly appreciate you sharing that personal information. Um, I, I went to a, a predominantly all-white school in McCook, Nebraska. This was back in the early 90s, and it was about 8,000 white people. The only black people was in that particular town was on the basketball team, and you could only keep a certain amount of, you know, out-of-staters. And I, I, I almost married this white woman, and, you know, but... I just, I mean, it was just something about a black woman that I just couldn't do it, but she was a good woman. And, and I really do apologize that I really broke her heart. And, you know, but anyway, during that time, I did experience a lot of racism. And there, there, were, there were times where I would walk to school and get heckled by the good old boys. I remember one time I was walking to school and um, they threw urine on me. You know what I mean? And so it, it was one of those situations where I really had to like go into the library and read history books so I can get strength from my my ancestors who have experienced that on a different magnitude to be able to make the right decisions. Because I believe that if I would have made the wrong decisions, it would have prohibited me from moving forward and getting the respect that I was able to obtain from that university. As a matter of fact, I became the first African-American to receive my associate science in pre-nursing. So with that being said, um, I really appreciate your knowledge. I really appreciate your integrity. I appreciate your, your boldness. Like you're a very bold person, a person of accountability, if I may say. And I think that people like you are, are needed in our communities because you'll call a spade a spade. And 
um, your your ability to communicate is very important. And I really enjoy just listening to you. Like I can listen to you for hours and hours and hours as like a student to a teacher. And maybe, I should, I, maybe I should be married to you because my wife says the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> You good, you good, you good, man. And like, yeah. um, my wife, she really prepared for this interview, and I was just, you know, kind of watching her prepare for it. And the reason why she said that she wanted to really, well, she always do, but she really respects you, respect your your expertise as a boxing expert. That's the way that she views you. And so she wanted to make sure that when she interviewed you today and asked you questions that you will walk away with the respect level that you didn't have initially from her, but after talking with her, you will have a different level of respect for her as a woman that's trying to advance in the boxing industry. Oh, I appreciate that. Yes, and I and I, and I feel that way. Um, Sheila asked very good questions, and um, if she has any more, ask them. Um, it's uh, boxing is not an easy thing. Um, it's been a male-dominated sport forever. Uh, and I'm talking about the business end of it, of course. And um, it uh, it's it's a tough sport. There's no question about it. It's a tough sport and it's a tough business. And you know, the sport and the business are two different things. Um, I've I've clearly defined what the difference is. Um, I, you know, it's uh, you try to be candid with people and you tell them the truth, and then they get mad at you because you have a difference of opinion, even though that you have the experience, the knowledge, you've been through it, you've seen it, and people don't get it. You know, but it, it is what it is. I mean, I get called racist on twitter all the time and says uh, you know that i'm racist because i don't like al Heyman. well i love don king what's that got to do with it's not race okay when if you don't like a person you're and you're justified for those reasons that's the way life's supposed to work if you're not if you just say i don't like a guy well, why well, i just don't like him well that's stupid that's ignorant i'm not ignorant i understand why i don't like people um, I don't like crimes against boxing for starters. I don't like the way the guy operates um, where nobody meets the guy. He doesn't um, speak for his fighters. He doesn't talk to the press. How do you how do you do anything with your fighters? How do you be a mouthpiece for your fighters? An advisor is a mouthpiece for the fighter. How do you be a mouthpiece for the fighter if you're not talking to the press? You don't grant interviews. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. You know, so. That's just the way it is. Many, many, many people agree with me, by the way. You know, they're afraid to say so because they don't have the gumption and the, and, the, and the mental moxie I do. And, you know, and put it this way to you, I got balls down on my ankles. And I'm not afraid of people. I tell it like it is. One the great thing about being Rick Glazer is I have many, many, many business accounts around the world. If I lost an account, it doesn't even show up with the bottom line. So I can be the person that I am. That's why I can't be... Um, uh, muzzled, you know, I'm not going to be told what to say or dictated to or anything like that because I can afford to be that person because if I lose an account, okay, I lost 10,000, 12,000 a year, 15,000 a year, but I've got 45 other, 46 other accounts, you know, I got 46 accounts right now around the world. And okay, so if I lost one, I'll have 45. Okay, no big deal. Doesn't Rick, change my living. Rick, nor, wanna, nor will I be compromised. I, I want to, I want to, you know, say this as a man coming to another man, right? And my wife has a level of passion for boxing that's it, she, she's out there. That's and, well, and, and well respected by me, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. And it's important to make sure that she is around people like yourself. So I'm asking you personally from, from man to man, and I say this with total humility and confidence. Now, you have balls of steel as, as well as I do. I'm, I mean, I don't fear nothing. I mean, that's just who I am. But anyway, like you say, the boxing industry is a is a platform for nothing. But, but, you know, it's cutthroat. I know that, right? Mm -hmm. And it will really mean a lot to me. And I know time is money for you. I know that you're a consultant. You, you do this, you do that. But I would appreciate if you would just always have your um, your phone 
available for Sheila to call you because you, 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 I, I, Mr. Stafford, I appreciate what you just said to me. Well respected, but you didn't even have to say that to me. Of course, I would treat your wife that way. Not because she's your wife, just because she's trying to succeed in professional boxing. And I help people succeed in professional boxing. That's one of the, that's one of the reasons why I feel I was put on earth. I've done all this. I've done, I've been doing this for 31 years and it's, it's just like, like people take a shower and get up in the morning, take a shower, brush your teeth. You know, to me, it's boxing. And, um, you know, people ask me why I'm on social media. Because I have boxing. to ask you that, though. I, I really oh, do. Because, of because course. it's important for me to show my support oh. towards my wife as her husband. A hundred percent. And I, I would do the same thing if I was you, to be honest with you. So I have no problem with it. You know, you guys are, are a great couple. I can tell. Um, you know, you're supporting your your wife. Your wife supporting you, and that's great. I feel the same way about my wife. So, I'm old school. I believe in that old school marriage. Um, I believe in you know being loyal. Um, I believe in all, all those things that really count. You know, it, it's a funny thing. My wife does these drawings, and she doesn't get to bed till four o'clock, three four o'clock in the morning because she'll draw for three four hours, right? And I'll be sleeping because I got to get ready to go for my business three or four o'clock. Well, she will come in. I said, wake me up. Well, you call me at three o'clock in the morning. Wake me up four. Wake me up. So wake me up and I get to work. Okay. And it's a great. And that's just how we operate. So we have this, um, this comrade. But I'm going to tell you a funny boxing story that you guys will like about my wife and I. And to tie it in with our marriage. You'll really like this. This is a great one. So before we were married, um. My wife used to stay here at my at my condominium. Well, not this one here, but the previous one I we I had when we went when I before I was married. And she's very old fashioned, so am I. So I she slept under the sheets and under the under the blankets, and I slept on top of the blanket and put another blanket over me. So she was there, I was here. We were within hands length, but it was hands off. I, I had no problem with that. I I agree. So. One night in the middle of the night, I get this phone call from Australia and I make this deal. And, and, and I I had the fighter in. I knew it already because the fighter was looking for a fight. I know how much he fights for. He's the guy's OK. Um, so the, my, I get off the phone from the guy and my wife says, did you have to take that call in the middle of the night? I says, honey, we I didn't say I I said we just made five thousand dollars. She says, keep taking those calls, keep taking those <laughs> calls. Now wait, that's not the funny part of the story. Okay. So now we're on a honeymoon. Five days we're on our 21 day honeymoon. Five days into the honeymoon, she says, Frick, what happened to those phone calls in the middle of the night where we're making five thousand? I says, Well, honey. Due to the fact that it's our, our honeymoon and everybody knows it, I e emailed everybody and told them to start out everything with an email or a text to not call me and wake me up out of respect for our honeymoon. She says, call those people back or email them back <laughs> immediately and tell them to start calling again, please. <laughs> so there you, there you go. That, that's, uh, that's the way it is. What can I tell you? Everybody likes that one. Well, well, Rick, we greatly appreciate your time. Yes, and, um, thank you. You know, this was more so like a, I, I felt like a, a kid talking to his parents. Like, you know, <laughs> just, you know, I'm just sitting here listening with tentative ears. And Do I look that old? Come on now. No, no I got a full head of hair. I, I'm no, not all wrinkled up. Come on now. No, Do no, I look no, like an old no. man to you? No, 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 no. I ain't bad looking now. No, no. It's just the respect level that we have for you. You know what I mean? And when a person has this type of experience in any industry and you trying to navigate through this industry, it's important to be all ears. You don't have nothing to talk about. You should be all ears listening and be grateful for this person's time. And I think that a lot of times people just don't respect people's time. But I understand and she don't understand that anytime that someone is able to give us their time, man, we appreciate it because that time that you gave us was an investment. It's like gold, gold nuggets. And we're going to take that conversation that you share with us. We're going to turn into a gold mine. I'm personally, uh -huh. I'm personally going to 
go back and look at this interview again because it was so much jewels that you dropped on this on this interview that I really need to really pay attention to as well as Sheila. And I know she's going to as well. Well, I I, I appreciate you guys having me. And uh, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, I just try to be the best person I can be every day and I do it daily. That's all there is to it. And if people don't like that about me, that's a shame. But, uh, you know, I get, like I said several times, I get accused of, by people on Twitter all the time of being racist and stuff. And one time I said to a guy, a uh, guy says to me, uh, who do you like in the fight, Crawford or Spence? I says, I says Crawford. This is when he was fighting for um, uh, Aram. I, I, I said, see, you're racist. He says, why am I racist? There's two black men. He says, he's fighting for the white man. Meaning Bob Aram. I mean, it's like this is the stuff you put up with. Or like you tell people who's going to win the fight between Fury and, uh, and Wilder. Fury. Well, see, you're racist. You want the white man. I said, no, I didn't say I wanted the white man to win. I said, he's going to win. He's the better fighter. He's got more tools. He's got more. He's got a bigger toolbox. He's got faster hands. He's more durable. Okay. And the meantime is you're, you're marked as a racist. You, you just you, being Rick Glazer, you can't win with certain people. You just can't win. And it, 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 you can't please the masses. It's very hard. But um, everybody that knows me as a, as a person, um, you know, one on one knows that I don't have a racist bone in my body. Um, and it, it, it's sad that people really think like this. They really, really, really think like this. You know, one time I, 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 um, I called a, uh, this is a black man type, not a, not a person of, of Puerto Rican descent. Oh, you know, what is he? I said, oh, he's Puerto Rican. See, you're racist. You call him a Puerto Rican. That's not a bad name. That's what he is. Okay. What am I supposed to say? He was born in Puerto Rico? No, I don't know if he was born in Puerto Rico. He might have been born in New York City. I don't know where he was born. He could have been born in Florida. Okay. So it's people just like they criticize, they, they critique everything you say. And I just wish people would critique me for the knowledge I can spin off and the potential help I can give them if they ask, if, if called upon, rather than saying to me, oh, you're racist. Then you're, you know, it's just, I just, I'm wore out. I'm almost, I'm almost, I was almost going to go off Twitter because I mean, just go to go back to Facebook. I, I'm on Facebook, but you know, I've got almost 10,000 followers between Twitter, Facebook, and, and Instagram. I've only a couple hundred some, it's no big deal, but the point is that I know I'm unfairly targeted as a racist and I don't know why, um, you know, they said one guy, one stupido said to me, which he's right about, but you know, that doesn't mean you're right. You're not a racist because you're married to a black woman just because you're fell in love with, with, love with a black woman. I says, well, that's true. I said, but do you think if I was really racist, I would have bothered to meet a black woman. So there's your answer right there. So yeah, I like to, extend this to you folks anytime you want to have me on the show again i'm ready willing and able as long as it's on, a, on an afternoon and, or an evening and it's not a, in the morning uh because i'm really busy in my mornings obviously with the boxing and also that um i enjoyed myself my phone is open to you um sheila for any kind of advice and you mr stafford for any kind of advice i can render you um whatever the situation is hopefully someday we'll meet in person and, you know, and uh, carry it even further. You never know. But uh, um, you guys can call me anytime you want. And you can have me on the show anytime you like. You ask great questions. And, um, um, I'm, you know, I'm glad I came on today. You know, I think you guys have a, a lot of potential with the show. I see the production's very good. I can see myself clearly. It isn't fuzzy. And not that I want to see myself clearly. <laughs> but, um, you know how it goes. But, uh here we are. So let me know when I can be of assistance to you, um, or whether it's over the phone or on your show. I'm, I'm glad to serve you guys at any, any time you want. Okay, can, you can consider me a friend now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. I want to. Give, I wanted to give out a shout out to Darian Johnson. Yes, sir. Omar Howard. Yes, sir. Rodney Whitehead. Yes, sir. And again, vinyl art. Ollie B, Scrapbook Boxing, and Batman 105 Able, and I think that's it. And uh, shout out to Rick Glazer, too. A real one. He's a real one, fellas. And we want to thank all of our viewers for joining us and those that are going to be watching this 
whether on uh, LinkedIn or YouTube. You can also listen to it audio, which is Spotify, Apple, Google, if you don't have time to do it anytime. Did you want to say anything? Um, no, because you know what? After this you know, lecture from Rick Glazer, he already gave so many nuggets. Okay. I don't even. I don't even want to come behind him. I'll leave you. I'll leave you this nugget from my father. I was ten years old. He gave me a speech. He says, "Son, never lie. Always tell the truth, because in the long run, the truth will always serve you better." I says, "Dad, what's the second one?" He says, "Always listen to your father. He's always <laughs> right." <laughs> so we we walked. We were at an airport in Philadelphia. We went to walk down this thing, and he said, "It's over to the left." I says, "Dad, it's over to the right." Eve, despite the fact you just told me you're always right. Yeah. So there you go. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm as close as the phone, and uh, if I could be any assistance to you in any way, I could help you out. Let me know, and I'd love to be on your show again. Just ask. You don't have to let me know six weeks in advance. I, if I cannot do it even the next day or later that day, I'll do it if, like, one of your guests fails to appear. You know, whatever the situation. If I can help you out, I'm going to. That's what I was put on earth to do, help people out in boxing. Okay? We appreciate that. Everybody, please make sure that you like, share, subscribe, leave a comment. Also go to the Stafford Boxing Club YouTube channel. Make sure that you do the same. And we are going to be out Stafford Boxing. The text me text me, the, uh, text me the link on my cell phone so I can put it up too. Okay? I got Thank you. Thank you. Have a, have a wonderful time. Bye-bye, folks. Thank you. Thank you.